are in listen only mode. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Joanna Maycock, I'm from the European Women's Lobby. We're going to start the webinar in about two or three minutes. So uh, please note that the webinar will be recorded. Uh, also, we're in a new system, which I'll explain in a moment. So bear with us if things don't quite go according to plan. But just wait another couple of minutes for the remaining attendees to, to get online. So, hello everybody. I hope you can see me and hear me. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on gender inclusion and the state of civil society that's been organized by Civicus. So, my name is Joanna um, from the European Women's Lobby and I will be kind of moderating the, the webinar today. So, thanks to all who have joined. Um, if you're a participant, you've been muted by, by me. So, um, if you want to speak or, or let yourself be known, you have to use the chat box, which hopefully you can see on your screen. So thanks all for being so flexible. Uh, as you saw, we had a problem with our original uh, technical web, web, um, WebEx setup for the conference or the webinar. So we have um, basically tried something different. So we hope this is going to work and we hope you're going to bear with us. So this is GoToMeetings. Um, what you should be able to see is a chat box somewhere. You can see also the screen, which says, which is, I'm going to show the PowerPoint presentation during the course of the, uh, of the webinar. You should be able to see myself, I hope. And I, when somebody else is presenting, if they want to put their video on, they, they will do so also. Um, we are recording the webinar today. We hope to be able to broadcast that to people who were not be able to participate today. So. Um, please note that that will be happening. Um, so we're going to have, um, essentially in terms of this housekeeping, I'm just going to show you another slide. I hope that works. Let's see. First challenge. Here we are. So you can interact. First and foremost, we've got a really great program of speakers, and I hope you'll be able to really listen and hope the sound quality is working. If you're using your uh, online sound and it's not working so well, there is an option to use your use a mobile or a normal um, desk telephone as well. So you can find that if you go back to the uh, GoToMeeting platform that you entered. On your screen, you will see a chat box um, where um, I'm just muting some other people there. There we are. Um, you should see a chat box at the bottom where you can put in any questions you have, to either to the whole audience um, or to the panelists. And when we come to the section of the meeting where we have questions, we'll use that space to really get the questions uh, going. If we have enough time, we might invite you to speak as well. So if you put your question in and we see we've got enough time, we might invite you to, to speak. So hopefully you've got microphones that are also set up. 
Um, so also, if you want to follow the discussion online or share your thoughts online, we've set up a hashtag. Uh, that's hashtag Civicus Gender. And you'll see on the screen in front of you the um, Twitter names of the different participants here. So um, you might want to think about copying your questions or comments to, to them as well. So that was just a little bit of housekeeping. Now I'm going to hand over to Danny, who's going to introduce you a bit more to the, the webinar, the background to it, and the Status of Society report and, and Civicus. So let's check if I can manage to do this. Um, let's see. I'm going to give you the power of speech, Danny. Seamlessly, there we are, and Yay. then I'm going, to change, I'm going to change you as the presenter. There we are, over to you. Brilliant, thank you so much, um, Joanna, and thank, hello everyone. I'm Danny Sreeskandarajar, I'm Secretary General of Civicus. Um, on behalf of my colleagues, thanks for joining us. Um, and apologies from us as well for the technical uh, issues. We're still learning how to... Uh, how to take advantage of these fabulous technologies to be able to connect with people who are in far-flung parts of the world. Uh, unfortunately, we had a monumental collapse of WebEx, the platform that we normally use. So thanks in particular to Joanna and colleagues at the European Women's Lo Lobby for stepping in and finding a tech fix for us. Um, for those of you who don't know us, Civicus is a global alliance of civil society. We're a, a network of, of activists and organizations committed to defending citizen action, to protecting civic space and enabling civil society to play our rightful role in life, in societies around us, in shaping policy and the communities that we, we live in. Uh, we, each year we publish a report called the State of Civil Society Report, our flagship uh, publication, if you will, and in it we try to take stock of what's been happening in civil society around the world. Then we also look at a theme each year, and this year, as Joanna says, the theme has been inclusion, and we invite some of our members and partners to contribute essays and their thoughts and perspectives on that theme. And my colleague Mandeep will tell you a little bit more about this year's theme and, and, uh, and particularly the lessons around gender. I wanted to just say the, the overarching reason why we chose inclusion and why we really wanted to have a, a discussion like this one today is because both externally and internally, we think that the gender dimensions of inclusion are hugely relevant for civil society. If we look out at the world out there, conditions for activists for civil society are getting worse, not better. Last year, my colleagues documented serious threats to one or more civic freedoms in 109 countries in all, all corners of the, of the globe. And that's, that number is getting higher, not lower. Last year it was only 96 countries. And so we would argue that the, the, the threats to civic freedoms, the threats to our fundamental rights to organize and mobilize are being threatened. And as Mandeep and others will talk about in this webinar, those conditions and that marginalization and exclusion seems to be borne unfairly by certain groups, particularly uh, feminists and, and, and gender activists. So if you are a, a, a woman human rights defender, for example, um, you're probably going to bear a, a huge burden in terms of these incursions on civic space. So the external threats for civil society generally, and particularly for those of us who care about gender equality, um, uh, are serious. But then and part of the report is also about internal, uh, look, looking at what civil society itself is doing to be more inclusive, to walk the talk, if you will, on equality, on all aspects of equality, but particularly gender uh, equality. And I was reminded of this, um, I think, in the first few months of, of starting at Civicus back in 2013, when we did a quick poll um, of, or quick survey of about 100 or so of the, of the biggest NGOs of the world, just to have a look at how many of them had women CEOs or chief executives. And it turned out at the time it was about 31 out of 100. And some people said, oh, that's not too bad. It's not, it's not as bad as big business. It's not as bad as politicians and government. But actually, it's horrible if you take the fact that in most civil society organizations, the majority uh, of staff are actually women. In some countries, the US and the UK, for example, we think that something like two-thirds of all staff in civil society organizations are women. So it's particularly worrying that the glass pyramid, as we call it, um, is so acute and palpable in civil society, despite the fact that we all talk a good talk when it comes to uh, equality. So 
the reason we did this report uh, on this theme was for, uh, for, for those external and internal uh, reasons, and we thought it would be useful to drill down on the question of gender and inclusion through a, a format like this one. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you again for joining us. Fingers crossed the technology works. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks very much, Danny. So, um, yeah, and I myself was really inspired by that work that Danny talked about, looking at the glass pyramid, because it reflected some uh, experiences that I'd had, um, certainly within ActionAid, where I worked at the time, where we were trying to address that gender imbalance within the organization through a range of, of quite far-reaching measures, actually. Um, and I was invited myself to participate in this year's State of Civil Society report, and I wrote an essay um, really looking at the, the glass pyramid and how to break it, and really thinking about how we can transform leadership through, through having uh, different and more diverse, and particularly more women in leadership, and how that's a, a, a moral but also business or um, uh, imperative for our organizations, as Danny clearly pointed out. But I'm not going to talk about that essay particularly today, although I might reference it during the rest of the, the webinar. So um, we have a really nice panel lined up, and the idea is really for the next sort of 40 minutes or so to hear a summary of the different essays that, that really tackled those issues of gender and diversity within civil society that were featured in the State of Civil Society report. Um, we will have the opportunity to have a question and answer discussion after that. And the idea is that we should wrap up by, by 3.30 European South African time. Um, and uh, I hope, I really hope the technology works. So again, if you can see the chat box and you want to raise questions in there, please feel free to do so. I'm going to, after I finish speaking, I'll send out a message to everybody and you can see if that, if that pops up. You can also, if you look at attendees, the little um, thing on the screen there, you can see who else is in attendance in the call at the moment. All the names are listed down there. There's about 20 participants and about five panelists at the moment. So, um, and perhaps just to say one uh, thing about the European Women's Lobby. So we're a, a European-wide uh, network of women's organizations campaigning for a feminist Europe, a dream that is a long way in the distance, unfortunately. Um, and we're concerned with a whole range of issues that, that affect women's rights and gender equality in Europe. And so the idea of having more diverse leadership, putting women and diverse groups at the center of decision making from the political to the business to the civil society world is really, really central for us. And that's about transforming the way we view, we view leadership and my does leadership need some overhaul at the moment. Um, and I think women are part of the solution to the sort of transformed leadership that we need for the world right now. So I'm going to ask now um, Mandeep, Mandeep Tuana from Civicus to present a little bit more about the State of Civil Society report and particularly the guest essays that, that were featured in this year's report, which looked at the issues of gender, diversity, and inclusion within, within civil society. So, um, Mandeep, it's going to be over to you in a second. If I can find you and unmute you. Yes, there we are. Great, Mandeep. Can you Thank speak? Thank you, Joanna. Yes, great. Over to you. I'm just checking I'm on the right... The right um, screen. Is that the correct yes. um, uh, PowerPoint screen for you? The, uh, the PowerPoint, no, I think uh, I'm not using PowerPoint, so you'll probably just have me on, on the camera. Okay. Just, I, but I'm showing, the, I'm showing the PowerPoint and I'm not sure I'm on the right place because I've kind of got uh, control of that as well. Perhaps do I need to speak through this, this one? So I think this is the idea of this is to um, guide you. Those of you can see the PowerPoint on your screen. There's a list of questions there. These are things that you might want to think about as we go through the presentations that might inspire a bit your questions for the discussion at the end. So first, what strategies do you use to challenge gender exclusion in your own organizational network? Or what have you seen with other organizations that have been effective or inspiring? Um, what do you think the mainstream civil society organizations could or should do to promote gender inclusion in their organizations? Uh, ideas of what helps or doesn't help. I mean, it's also good to hear some things that don't, that don't particularly help. Um, thoughts or questions about what or examples of what the main benefits of gender equality or greater gender equality in our sectors or movements might be. 
and um, what the implications particularly might be for Civicus or networks like Civicus. So I'll come back to this screen later I, if I remember um, and can find it. And um, we will also, just at the end, be collecting uh, your feedback as well on the webinar. So there'll be an opportunity for you to give your feedback. So now I'm going to move on. And I hope this is going to be the correct screen, if there is any, for, for uh, Mandeep. So over to you. Thanks, Joanna. And I'm um, very excited to be at this uh, webinar. Uh, of course, I apologize for all the, the hassles that you've had uh, with the technology. But I'm, thank you for bailing us out. So uh, my brief is to talk a little bit about the State of Civil Society report. Uh, our 2016 State of Civil Society report is under the theme of exclusion in civil society. Uh, it's, it's, it's a report that is not just of civicus. In fact, we've got uh, 33 leading practitioners and activists who have written essays on this report, including yourself and the others who are on the panel. But we've also interviewed uh, people from around the world on different aspects of different uh, issues that affect civil society. So it really is a report that celebrates civil society but also takes talk about the health of civil society and gives an idea of some of the key trends that are shaping civil society in our times today. So in arriving at this theme of civil society and inclusion, we also looked at what is the test of a just society. A just society is a society which creates equality of opportunity, which treats people with equity, with dignity, and where more importantly disadvantaged populations uh, have an equal access to uh, services and or also have, uh, have equal access to decision making. And on this test we found that many of our societies are failing, even uh, societies that are, that, you know, that profess to be uh, developed or uh, mature democracies uh, are failing on this. And of course, uh, gender is a very big and a very major aspect of exclusion uh, because it affects the majority of the population. And exclusion itself as a concept is multi-layered and dynamic. For example, if you belong to an impoverished community, you are, you are excluded automatically. But if you belong to a disadvantaged minority and you are already impoverished, you are further excluded. And then if you happen to be a woman, you're further excluded or if you happen to be a Dalit woman or you happen to be a woman from an indigenous community in a, in a country where indigenous communities are still having challenges uh, fully accessing their rights, uh, you, have, you have further problems. But even in societies where, uh, which have made great strides on economic and other social indicators, we find that women are oftentimes denied equal pay for equal work. And in many countries, they don't have equal rights as far as property is concerned, as far as marital rights are concerned, as far as succession is concerned, or even as far as uh, uh, taking care of their children, being able to have guardianship of their children are concerned. So this is a big challenge uh, that is faced by women human rights defenders and by uh, civil society organizations that uh, work, uh, work towards the ideal of equal rights for all, including uh, women and disadvantaged uh, populations. Uh, and in many parts of the world, we find that women human rights defenders and LGBTI activists and transgender activists uh, who, who challenge the status quo of, uh, of disadvantages being, uh, being placed on uh, people because of their gender, uh, are, facing, uh, are facing very serious challenges because they are seeking a redistribution of power and this is automatically being resisted by those who hold power. And, and oftentimes in these forces that are challenging women human rights defenders are using rhetoric of national values, cultural values, religious values, they are retreating into that and trying to undermine the universal human rights discourse and the, and, and, uh, the progress that we've achieved over the years. I know Danny mentioned earlier that we have 109 countries around the world where one or more of the core civil society freedoms of expression, association and peaceful assembly have been threatened. Now this is a very serious situation. But even, and in these situations, we find that the civil society of excluded groups face an additional set of challenges. And within this, the women's movement faces an additional set of challenges from authoritarian governments who, given the, the situation in our times, are increasingly using the security rhetoric, using the rhetoric of counterterrorism discourse 
and within this rhetoric of security and counterterrorism discourse what what is happening is that the quest for social justice that social justice values social justice policies are sort of falling by the wayside and in, and you see a, a, the birth of a machismo a macho kind of politics which is you know based more on aggressive militarism which is in fact the antithesis of uh, of a gender just society and and in, within this framework of the rise of authoritarianism the rise of militarism we are also finding that there is a there there is a corresponding rise in extremist ideology in fact we have pop, we have politicians who use very complicated words like bigly and who and who have all, all, oftentimes been you know uh, been been uh, been uh, complicit in 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 actually undermining women's rights and the dignity of women in many parts of the world and uh, and there's a lot of this wild, you know, the violent extremism is is a, is a big is a major challenge to uh, women's rights activists, and in some cases, of course, it's it's from uh, terrorist groups when women rights activists speak against the imposition of religious ideologies that are inimical to equal rights for men and women, or in other cases, it's it's due to uh, market fundamentalism where women's rights activists that have been challenging major major projects who've been challenging uh, big dams and so on are seen as a seen as as an impediment to the you know to the business discourse of again oftentimes uh, these you know these strong men politicians and obviously who've colluded with big business with big business people uh, and and they've had to pay the ultimate price for their work and for their beliefs but civil society and women and the women's rights movement is not in an uh, accepting a narrative of disempowerment in fact many uh, gains are being made in fact uh, because of the efforts of the women's movement uh, the committee on economic and social and cultural rights has actually looking has reinterpreted the definition and reinforced uh, the right to uh, sexual and reproductive health uh, over the course of last year uh, there's uh, there's been several uh, there've been several uh, wins that have been made as far as progressive legislation is concerned with regard to domestic violence with regard to sexual harassment policies uh, that have been put in place uh, in many countries uh, there's been greater calls for justice in the in the case of violence against women uh, and, 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 and achievements have been made and more importantly uh, 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 on the international stage the sustainable development goals framework actually has has, uh, has of course the theme of gender justice running throughout it but importantly uh, under SDG 5 there is, a, there is a call to all countries of the world to end discrimination on the basis of gender under goal 10 there is a call to and inequality including gender based inequality and to create equal economic opportunities for women under goal 16 there's a call to create uh, inclusive societies and to put in place uh, mechanisms and institutions uh, to ensure that there is a, there is equality in societies and also within the concept of inclusion the um, equal rights of women are, are, are placed front and center under goal 17 itself there is a call to collect data and to collect data, disaggregate data on the basis of gender. So of course, uh, all of these uh, achievements, all of this, uh, this understanding within the international legal framework is, has, is a testament to the success uh, that civil society has had in being, uh, taking forward the gender justice discourse. Of course, there's a big challenge that lies ahead of us now to make sure that these uh, great, uh, that these that these great commitments are now implemented at the national level and uh, many of us are already working towards this. Uh, so while we have made uh, great strides, while a lot of civil society emphasis has been on, you know, on, on changing the governance discourse, changing the public discourse, I think our report also uh, looks, uh, uh, looks in inwards and shines a spotlight and Danny did mention in his introduction you know, there are many civil society organizations need to do much more as far as women in leadership positions are concerned. There are oftentimes, there are women who, who, are, who are staffing many civil society organizations, but oftentimes you find that the top jobs are still occupied by men and oftentimes in the bigger organizations, uh, these problems are even more protracted uh, than, in, uh, than in the smaller uh, community-based organizations or those that are working at the grassroots level. 
But more importantly, while we are working towards progressive policies on maternity leave, uh, progressive policies on sexual harassment, uh, progressive policies as far as childcare are concerned, and we are, you know, we are working with governments to make sure that these are legislated and and uh, and implemented across the board. Our own organisations sometimes are failing because sometimes because of lack of resources and oftentimes because of lack of will. Uh, and and I think we need to also. Uh, can carry out audits within our own organizations to see whether our policies are, are uh, meeting the, the gender equity test. And in fact, at Civicus, we ourselves have, uh, have uh, promised to put, put ourselves in the, uh, into a, a subject, to subject ourselves to an inclusion audit where we'll, uh, where we'll uh, look at our own policies and, uh, and ensure that uh, they reflect the best uh, within the, the civil society sector. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mandeep. That was a really fantastic introduction and I think really sets clearly why this is an issue for Civicus and for the civil society more, more broadly. I'm going to try and put my camera on so you can see me here in Brussels uh, on an unusually sunny day. Um, so thank you very, Mandeep, very, very much for that, Mandeep, and I hope people have some questions. Again, I'm just going to direct you down to the chat box. Uh, in the bottom. I didn't see anybody uh, writing any questions in there, so I'm not sure whether you've all identified the, the space where the chat box is, but it's sort of down the list, webcam, audio, dashboard, etc. There's a little thing to click and, and you can make comments or ask questions in there. Okay, so our next uh, panelist is Sudarshana Kundu from Gender at Work, and Sudarshana is in Hyderabad today, um, where she's going to tell us a little bit more about gender at work and particularly about the essay that she contributed um, to the Civicus State of Civil Society report, uh, which I really, really enjoyed. I think a, a really good case for why this matters, but also some really um, practical ideas about how you can start to address gender and diversity and balance in your own leadership and organizations. And so the essay was called Inclusion and Equity, Holding the Mirror Up to, our, to Ourselves. So Darshan, I'm just going to try and give you your voice back. If you hold on a second, I will give you your... Uh, give you the microphone in a second and then it's over to you i think you're muted sudarshana so you need to unmute before you can speak yes okay. yes over, you to me? You. over to you perfect okay great okay great, great. thanks joanna uh, so first of all i'd like to thank civicus for uh, actually taking on this issue of equity and inclusion uh, for the report itself and for organizing uh, this webinar. It's such an important uh, subject, but uh, doesn't get discussed as much. Uh, so thanks for giving us, uh, all, all those people who work on these issues, this platform to have this discussion with a wider range of uh, audience. Uh, so uh, as, uh, as Joanna mentioned, the, it, let me just, before I get into the paper, let me just uh, talk a little bit about gender at work, just a few uh, uh, sentences. Uh, generative work is uh, a large uh, a transnational network of feminists. Uh, we work primarily in uh, terms of looking at gender equality within organizations and changing social norms. Uh, that's our focus. We are, uh, and we say we are a network organization because we're really, really not structured uh, in a typical uh, way. We have a, a fixed office, so we have a fixed structure. Uh, we have a set of associates who are actually spread across uh, 10 countries. There are 25 associates who all work around gender equality and organizational issues, but they spread across uh, 25 organizations. Uh, and, and that's uh, all I'll talk about the network for now. Uh, in terms of the paper, you know, uh, both Danny, Mandeep, and Joanna mentioned about uh, how how important it is to kind of reflect uh, inwards in terms of in our own organizations uh, and see what's the status of gender equality. Uh, you know, we all know that civil society organizations are expected and they in fact spotlight and address inequalities, discrimination and systematic disadvantages that exist in the society. Uh, especially we know that, you know, a lot of these, as Mandeep mentioned, women's rights defenders and feminist movements have actually moved uh, some of these, uh, some of the laws, legal frameworks uh, forward in terms of giving uh, women 
uh, justice and taking these women's human rights discourse forward. However, just because uh, these organizations are fighting to advance human rights, it does not mean that the same set of organizations uh, actually practice uh, uh, equality and inclusion on the inside. Uh, from our own long experience of working uh, with a range of organizations, and we've worked with uh, large international organizations, and we've worked with a really grassroots uh, women's rights organization, uh, we've seen that the same discriminatory practices that are played out outside uh, are often played inside as well. Um, and, and, and like it is outside these organizations, there is this veil of silence uh, around talking about the issues of exclusion discrimination. So, uh, so we wanted to kind of dig deeper uh, and, uh, and see what exactly is happening on in, in the, around the issue of gender equality uh, within civil society organizations. Because as, uh, as Mandeep said, as Joanna said, as uh, Dani said, this is deep implications for the kind of work that we do. If we really want to just successfully challenge uh, marginalization, challenge inequality, uh, we need to hold it mirror up to ourselves. But when we started looking at what's happening in the civil society organizations, we hit a roadblock. Uh, because there's really very little publicly available data around gender equality within CSOs. Uh, we we have a lot of anecdotal evidence, and I'm sure everybody uh, around her has some uh, some kind of uh, anecdotal evidence. And for example, uh, I come across a lot uh, from a lot of the civil society organizations who tell us, "Oh, we are really meritocratic. We don't don't have any kind of race-based or gender-based or caste-based uh, discrimination within our organization." Uh, but how do you kind of challenge that? And how do you hold uh, this uh, this kind of discourse on to the CSOs themselves? Uh, we, we then kind of said, uh, let's kind of look at uh, if there are research out there. Uh, and But again, unlike uh, the corporate sector, where now diversity and inclusion has become a buzzword. Uh, and, and because of that, there's a lot of tracking that's ha happening. Uh, and large organizations are actually tracking the data around what's happening in terms of women's leadership, what's happening in terms of equality and diversity. There isn't comparable globally available data in, uh, on equality and inclusion, particularly gender equality, uh, in, in the CSO sector. So what we decided to do, therefore, is to look at uh, a set of studies or um, research that is out there. With. These are isolated studies. These are peer research and we also uh, did a small uh, study in India to kind of uh, bring bring this to light. Uh, here's, here's what we found uh, from from that study. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, if you actually look at uh, the uh, data around leadership, and this is exactly what Danny had also mentioned at the beginning, uh, you will see that. Uh, uh, that in terms of the uh, leadership uh, leadership data, it's exactly uh, that the, we know that majority of the employees uh, in nonprofits are women. In India, about more than you know, 50 to 60 percent, depending upon the organization, are women. And yet, uh, uh, very few are in leadership roles. Uh, the proportion of women leaders uh, in India is, you know, women-led organizations are probably about uh, about you know 20 percent to 30 percent, depending upon the size of the organization. And as the size of the organization increases, uh, this uh, the, the the proportion of organizations which are women-led uh, actually fall. Uh, so for organizations in India, for example, which are greater than 750,000 US dollars, uh, the number of female-led organization halves from you know, uh, in comparison to men, it's almost just half of what uh, the number of organizations that are led by men. Uh, in the U.S., it's roughly the same. Uh, from the studies that we saw, uh, it's about you know 19% of the organizations 
uh, in some of the studies were led by men. And, and again, uh, that, that kind of changes as the organization study, or size of the organization increases. Uh, uh, in some sense, uh, we also then look to pay with the globe and what's happening. So if you look at guide star research, you will see uh, that uh, the pay equity for smaller organizations is about, you know, women get less than 8% and uh, women CEOs get less than 8% of what male CEOs get uh, for organizational sizes is 250,000 or less. But organizations which are large, that's about, uh, you know, $25 million or more, the pay equity uh, difference that also increases, the pay equity gap increases to about 23 percent. So again, some of this can be explained by the size of the organization. The size of the organization increases their ability to pay uh, is higher, and that's where there are less of women who are in leadership positions, so therefore they get paid. But there is also studies which say that for uh, organizations which are of similar size, uh, the pay gap remains. Uh, the second is that uh, we, we, once we've looked at that, we also looked at what's happening in terms of just compliance to law and infrastructure facilities. Uh, and here also we are seeing that, yes, organizations are actually complying with the law. So for example, India, for example, has a sexual harassment uh, policy which kind of says that you need to set up certain kinds of internal complaints committee. So organizations are complying with the law but are doing very little beyond that to actually ensure gender equality within the organizations. Similarly, if you take the case of, say, uh, maternity benefit, uh, organizations are complying with, with, with the law, but very few organizations in, in, our, in our data sample, less than half, are providing any additional benefits beyond what is kind of provided uh, as the bare bones in the law. Uh, and almost uh, none, maybe one or two organizations are actually providing paternity leave. So even in terms of infrastructure, uh, you know, like legal compliance uh, beyond, we are actually doing not so good. Uh, in in the sample that we saw, for example, uh, only uh, only 38 percent of the organizations had child care facilities. Uh, here are organizations which are actually going out out uh, to the communities talking about uh, child development schemes and talking about child rights, but many of them, and most of them actually, didn't have child care facilities for their own women and girls. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, then, if that's in terms of, you know, the number of positions, but what are we doing in terms of actually uh, getting women to become, uh, uh, to rise at high, rise through the pipeline, and we again saw that uh, that there are a few organizations which actually have leadership programs. If you uh, you know if you look around now in terms of organizational development, and if you look at the kinds of uh, executive education corporate trainings that are available, there is a plethora of women's leadership programs that are out there right now. Uh, but there are very few women leadership programs for the nonprofit sector, for the civil society sector as well, and very few organizations themselves actually have a dedicated women's leadership program. Uh, so, for, for in our uh, in our uh, study again, uh, uh, we saw that only 23 percent of the organizations that we had surveyed had dedicated mentorship program for women. Now, compare that, uh, and this is a comparison in India itself. Compare Compare that to a catalyst study for the corporate sector, which says, which said that 71% of the companies had a formal mentorship program. Uh, so, so there is the, so there is a lot to be done in terms of you know looking at programmatic, uh, looking at kinds of initiatives um, that need to be take, put in place. When we ask organizations, with what do I look at as one of the key challenges in terms of achieving gender equality, uh, most of them, uh, uh, around 70% of the organizations actually said uh, the dual work burden that women face. And yet, the uptake on workplace policies that actually address uh, this dual work burden is really, really low. 
uh, there are very few organizations which actually provide flexible uh, work, flexible timing, flexible workplace policies, remote working. So we've not really kept up with the changes in technology or even changes otherwise of uh, workplace policies that we are seeing in maybe in some of the other developers. Developed Great. Countries. So Darshna, um, can I ask you to, yeah. to, to bring it to a close now, just another 30 seconds or one minute, thank you. Sure, sure, sure. sure. So, uh, so we we kind of uh, we we seen so uh, we seen some of these gaps, and one of the things that I just wanted to highlight, and this takes us back to where we began, is that most of these organizations are, are really uh, not monitoring uh, progress. There are no indicators internally in terms of to monitor the progress that's happening around uh, gender equality. Uh, less than 50% of the organizations actually do gender audits. Uh, and even if they do gender audits, they're not really, they're one-off and they're not intrinsically related to any of the other management processes that happen. So this brings us back to the original question of uh, what kind of data do we have uh, and, uh, and how do we generate this data so that we can hold a mirror up to themselves. One of the things that we would like, uh, like some of us to take up is to think about looking at uh, possibly a gender scorecard or a diversity scorecard for organizations like Civicus does, uh, they do have a gender uh, civil society index. Can we think of something similar to think about equality and inclusion issues in, uh, in, in the civil society sector? So yeah, and let's have a discussion around that. Great, thank you really very much for that and I hope we can have in the discussion a bit more of your kind of advice about what we can do to improve the situation and also what gender at work can provide as sort of services and support in those in those efforts. So thanks very much to Darshana, that was really brilliant. And I urge people to also go and read the essay, which was really, really full of um, great, great ideas and, and information as well. So now we are going to go to East Africa. Uh, Mutsia Leonard uh, from the East African Sexual Health and Rights Initiative um, is going to speak to us about their work and about the essay that she contributed to the uh, Civica State of Civil Society report, Resilience and Resistance, the Determination and Progress uh, of Civil Society for and by Sex Workers, sex, uh, Sexual and Gender Minorities in East Africa. Let's see, I'm just going to try and give you your voice back, and I hope that's all going to work. Ooh. Yeah, I think we can hear you. Go ahead. Hello? Yeah, please go ahead. Hello? Okay, okay. Uh, sorry, sorry, but I am joining, joining on phone, and, and it just, it just, it's been having, been having echoes, echoes, which is a bit annoying for me. You probably can't hear the echoes, but I'll, I'll so try we can, to talk about that. We can, so we can hear you with a little bit of echo, so I think maybe you're near your screen or hearing the feedback as well. So. But we can hear you, so I'm going to mute, and you should just try and speak slowly, and let's see if it works. And I'll intervene if it's not working so well. But it's over to you. Okay. Okay. So I think I figured out what I was doing wrong. I was on GoToMeeting and on my phone at the same time, but I, I changed that. So my name is Leticia, and Leticia is actually a he. <laughs> but I, um, um, I'm going to be discussing the the context within which. Uh, LGBT and sex work as civil society works in Eastern Africa and the contributions that UHAI uh, makes an effort towards uh, gender inclusion. Um, I'll start by setting a context for the work that we're doing in East Africa. Uh, impunity and corruption are the biggest problems across Africa and civil society has been organizing across Africa for quite a while to be able to increase citizen consciousness and citizen participation, particularly around controversial issues of government accountability. And civil society has undertaken civic education on laws, on voter literacy, um, and has been very proactive in advocacy for accountability. And although impunity and corruption remain as the most critical political challenges in East Africa today and across Africa, public consciousness and criticism has grown and is active and is increasingly protected because of the work that the mainstream civil society has done. However, 
the vigor and aggression of civil society is not appreciated by governments and they're increasing pressures to um, counter their aggression. And just to give a few examples of things that have been on the news internationally, Burundi's government used a lot of violence and murder and bank account freezes to demobilize civil society and dissenting voices last year following the election. Um, Uganda has been a very unfortunate case of the most frequent um, sequence of constraining freedoms of association and expression um, in a way that Tanzania seems to have picked up this year, where um, there's a spiteful effort by government to deregister civil society, close down shop in the pretense of um, regulating um, NGO work. And Ethiopia is another haunting model of how successful government intervention can be. But even though it looks all bleak, um, there's a growing vocal and visible movement of sex workers and sexual and gender minorities that are working towards complicating the gender conversation. It's very easy for East African governments and African governments in general to limit the conversation of gender to a conversation on the equality of men and women and stray from realizing um, the, the pertinent issues that arise from patriarchy. And, and it's, 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 it's really exciting the contribution that uh, LGBT and sex worker civil society have made to address the negative and hostile opinions in um, communities and to actively mobilize and educate people on exclusion. However, religious, traditional, and political leaders are taking advantage of the negative public opinion to consolidate their own political support. And they do this by using hate speech around sexuality and gender so as to divide civil society between the good civil society that protects the poor and is invested in girl child education and the bad foreign civil society ideas that challenge the institutions of family and faith. Um, and as citizens are finding new ways to organize and challenge ignorance, governments are finding new ways all the time to constrain space, to constrain voice by labeling everything they dislike or that is against their political agenda as imported or foreign. Um, so the increasing discussions by governments about the need to regulate civil society, and this case for regulation is based on protecting the national values of accountability and transparency within civil society, but in a way that um, is, not, is, is not matching the model that the government operates in, because the government do not hold themselves to the same standards of accountability and transparency with regards to their spending public funds. And this conversation is, is supporting efforts to actually limit how much foreign funding civil society can access to further this liberal ideas of LGBT equality or decriminalization of sex work. Um, and so there's a growing political trend to strengthen laws that criminalize same-sex sexual relations and sex work, but also to go beyond that and criminalize association around this issue and criminalize uh, expression um, and, and, and make it difficult for sexual and gender minorities and sex workers to coordinate themselves, organize, run clinic programs. And it's clear to some people in the general public that what the traffic and government are doing is looking for scapegoats, looking to divert attention from their own poor governance and accountability, but it's not clear to most people. Um, uh, so civil society continues to aggressively advocate for rights, democracy, and good governance so as to help the public actually see the fallacy in, in, in the oppression that the governments um, are applying on uh, marginalized communities. Um, <coughs> civil society in East Africa is increasingly using legal systems and courts, courts as an avenue for promoting and protecting freedoms and rights sex workers across the region and LGBT persons are taking people to task to redress issues of violence. Um, we have constitutional petitions to challenge the penal code provisions that uh, criminalize same-sex sexual conduct, that criminalize um, uh, sex work activity. Um, 
and there's successful legal prosecutions of perpetrators of violence and <clears throat> a lot of promise to have the greater agenda of the final decriminalization of um, same-sex sexual relations and sex work. <clears throat> um, as, a, as a close for the, the context of civil society, I'll give two examples of progressive work that's happened in Kenya in the last three years. In the last three years, there's been a successful win for the registration of the Transgender Education and Advocacy, a uh, uh, leading trans advocacy organization, the National Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission, um, and both of these organizations are registered in those names and recognizing that they exist to protect those sexual and gender minorities. Um, and also, um, a trans woman was able to get a ruling <coughs> to oblige the Kenya National Examination Council to uh, reprint her examination certificate to reflect her preferred name. So, even though there's a lot, there's a lot of bleak, um, um, and, and 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 a lot of loss of hope based on government pressure, there's also some promise um, in the work. And Uhai is existing to fund the fight and to support strategies that maintain the agency and self determination of. Um, various LGBT and sex worker constituents to make sure that they get included in national policy and they get protected by the governments that seek to serve them. Okay. Thank you very much for that. And apologies for uh, misgendering you at the beginning. Great. Okay. So um, that brings us to the end of our panel um, panel contributions for now. Um, unfortunately, Kathy Mulville from WNRR uh, was unable to join us today, um, which is a shame, but I would definitely direct you to read her essay as well as the other essays in this series, which are all like full of really fantastic um, information, advice, and, and stories as well. So people really giving... Um, giving witness and bearing witness to the, the challenges we're facing in terms of a more gender diverse uh, leadership and participation in civil society. So I wanted to, I didn't see any questions yet, and I don't know whether that's because nobody knows how to raise their hand or ask questions, but please use the chat box if you can. I, I saw a few of you had managed to work that out. So um, Syra, who's set up this, uh, he's been brilliant enough to set up this call Today, this webinar today is keeping an eye out for any questions you might have, and I guess you might be able to also email them to her if somehow this is not this is not working. So I am going to take the initiative of really going back to ask our panelists some some questions. I've put up on the screen some kind of ideas about the the, the issues that might spark some some questions, and we really like to hear from other participants if they've got any great examples. Uh, or of really good practice or really terrible practice um, across civil society that they would like to, they would like to share as well. So, um, so Darshan, I'm going to come back to you because I did cut you quite short at the at the end there, and I wondered um, in particular if you could give us sort of. Um, I mean, it's really shocking when I hear you say, and I've seen the same thing, that actually civil society seems to be taking this less seriously, this issue of gender and diversity less seriously than even the private sector. So the more progressive uh, or forward-looking private sector organizations seem to have a lot more practice. Um, and, um, and I wondered, therefore, perhaps if you could give us some, like the top pieces of practice that a given organization could do, uh, if they could do three things to make a difference within their organization, what, what might those be? And I'm gonna take, I think you're still on mute, so I'm just going to find you back and unmute you. I hope you can, uh, you're still there to speak. So, Darshan, are you there? Okay. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, so you, uh, so I can hear you now. Okay. Uh, so one of one of the things uh, in terms of, and which is what we call, um, it, 
in general, uh, what general at work calls is you know the talks of deep structures, right? Which is if anybody's uh, looked at the general at work analytical framework, and I don't know if we have time, but I can share it on screen. Uh, it's on our bottom left hand corner, which is about looking at uh, really informal norms and exclusionary practices. Uh, that's the uh, that's the place where actually uh, make having interventions has the most impact. Uh, so in terms of kind of looking at the organizational culture and kind of trying to make that more general equal, uh, one of the things that has really worked for organizations uh, in our experience and, in, and we've seen it from the report as well is creating the space for reflection uh, for people to kind of come together and have conversations around equality and inclusion uh, so that you can actually surface the uh, differences uh, amongst individuals and, and also uh, create a shared common understanding around equality and inclusion. Uh, the second uh, thing that's really, really important is leadership commitment. So you'll have so uh, so this is this kind of goes back to the CSO leaders in terms of showing and demonstrating commitment towards uh, gender equality. And this could be through their conversations. This has to be through the kind of uh, practices they kind of uh, put in place, which could be uh, workplace practices, which would be in terms of mentoring practices. But this has to be about looking at uh, 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 leadership commitment towards uh, towards gender equality in the organization. Uh, uh, and the third third thing, and especially in uh, developing country context, is actually uh, and this goes back to the challenges that we uh, we saw is looking at workplace policies. Um, addressing the dual care burden in within civil society you know, uh, that women even within civil society organizations have to address and that we sometimes don't think about it uh, the, the the structures and the uh, work workplace policies are completely the same as they are in the corporates uh, and 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 it's time that we kind of listen on those and change those within the civil society sector so uh, you asked me for three those would be the top three Fantastic. Joanna. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. I've now discovered a whole secret place where questions are coming up, so I'm really pleased to be able to give, and I, I think I can even give you all voice. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, Syra is very frustrated because she she organized this, but because we had to change the technology, it seems like I'm the only one who can see all the different bits, um, so I'm really stretching the multitasking here. But uh, Sudarshana, that was really great, and I would really agree with you first to say I think there's creating space for reflection. Um, I found that creating women only or, or, or spaces where people who identify as women can get together and really reflect on the issues that they're facing and, and be heard and be taken seriously. And the, the idea of leadership commitment and then the really practical things about work, work, uh, workplace policies. So I'm going to now find um, back some of the questions and I might try and even give you uh, the floor. So. Um, I see Sunita Kotnala. I'm going to come and try and give you your voice. So make sure you're you're on. Um, you've got your microphone switched on. I'm going to find you back. So this is going to be interesting. Yes, I'm now going to try and give you the voice. So let's see if it works. No, I can't see you. Sunita, okay. You you are yourself on mute, Sunita. So you need to unmute yourself. Now, can you hear me? Please, please introduce yourself and give your example or question. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Sunita Kotnala, and I represent Sati All for Partnerships in India. Although I'm located in Australia. So, um, and we work primarily with women and land rights and um, and uh, in gender resource gap um, uh, in India. Um, so, I just wanted to say in terms of Sudarshana's um, findings and her presentation, and I wanted to add that um, we are finding a similar thing in Australia as well, 
in terms of uh, the response from the NGO sector. Uh, in fact, recently there's an organization called Pro Bono which has undertaken quite a bit of research and it found that in terms of gender equality and diversity, the NGOs were actually, um, uh, you, you know, they, they were actually falling behind. And um, in terms of uh, fle flexible working hours and all to encourage, um, you know, more opportunities for women to work, um, uh, the, the issue remains that, okay, legally there is flexible working hours options available, uh, but when it comes to uh, actually making them available, or, um, most managers are quite reluctant uh, to, um, you know, apply those in the work situations. Um, and uh, uh, the last thing that I wanted to say was that, uh, however, there has been quite a significant push uh, to include more and more women on boards uh, because uh, both company boards and NGO boards and um, and one of the reasons is because what they found is that uh, when there are more more representation of you know different genders on the boards, then um, there is likely to be you know more equitable um, opportunities and distribution of resources. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank Thanks. you, thank you very much for for sharing that. I'm going to try my my camera as well. There we are. Uh, thanks very much for sharing that. Um, there's been quite a lot of effort in Europe to actually legislate at the, for the corporate world to have a higher percentage of women on corporate boards, which has had quite some impact, certainly in terms of the numbers of women on, on corporate, non-executive boards at least, um, in, in quite a number of countries, including Germany and Italy and, and, and Belgium as well. Um, and what, there are some really interesting findings about that, that... Um, they find that it also, when you start to have quotas for women on, on corporate boards, that also increases other kinds of diversity like age and, and race and even sexuality, which is quite interesting because the boards, the companies have to become more professional in their recruitment practices. So they have to look outside of their immediate circle of, of friends. Um, and I was recently on a debate panel in the US at a corporate women's event. So it was women from the corporate world. And um, we had like a debate pro, for and against quotas. And I was told absolutely categorically in the US, people will never vote in favor of quotas at the end of the debate. And we won completely overwhelmingly. I think there's a level of frustration that these, these kind of voluntary measures are just not getting anywhere and not cutting through. So I think some of those, we don't, nobody likes quotas, in fact. Nobody likes them, but they're a very useful means to kind of break some of the systems of, of patriarchy in decision-making. So I'm going to come to um, Karen, Philip. Karen, you asked a really interesting question to Mandy, but I wonder whether you'd like to say it yourself, if we can work that out. I'm going to put you on unmuted now. Go ahead, Karen. Are you all hearing me? Yep. Okay, hi. Um, yes, I am Karen. I'm representing Caribbean Policy Development Center. And I really like the presentation that Mandy did talking about the lack of inclusion in, with women as it comes to the development sector and the projects. But I was wondering what does a, a gender mainstream project look like? And often when I hear about women being ex, um, taken advantage of, it's from the project's view as in we're going into the community and we want the woman to do this, but we expect it in kind. We're not giving her any money. But I was wondering if you found I was also through within the, the development sector itself, as in the employees themselves. Is it that women are also expected to do more than the man and put it down as an in-kind contribution? Great question. Mandy, I've just unmuted yes, you. Not, Go ahead. Yes, now, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, I can. Wonderful. So thanks a lot. That, that, that's, that's a good question. I think one of the main things is, of course, to take off our blinkers, you know, when we do recruitment, is to, you know, is, 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 is an organization needs to create the right kind of environment first, 
which which allows people of all genders, not just men and women, but people who also identify themselves as intersex or transgender people, you know, to provide that environment where everybody can thrive, to also constantly be on the lookout to ensure that there's pay parity, that to you know to con uh, to continuously do gender audits, to look at their own internal policies and ensure that there is proper gender parity as far as key positions in the organization are concerned, as far as management positions are concerned. And, and more importantly, I think where a lot of civil society organizations sometimes fail is we have these macho working cultures, long hours in the office. Now this sometimes may not be conducive, particularly to women who are oftentimes in most societies the primary child bearers. And, and I think it's about creating the right conditions for uh, for uh, staff and from you know for members of organizations to actually could have their work and not be disadvantaged on account of their gender. Uh, you know, if if, um, if people are supposed to uh, have a uh, women bear children, for example, and and an organization has a responsibility to ensure and to accommodate the fact that women bear children and they're going to have to go on maternity leave. So uh, you know, but but what I, the point I was trying to make is that. While many of us in civil society are more uh, more sensitive than in other sectors, than oftentimes in the public sector, than in the corporate sector, but we still have a long way to go uh, as far as uh, achieving uh, the, the right balance uh, and uh, achieving gender justice within our organizations are concerned. The other point I want to make is the second the gender justice is also it's it's a dynamic concept. So, for example, we may achieve parity as far as equal work for equal pay is concerned in an organization. But then we have to continue, we have to continue, keep changing the bar. Then we have to see what are our leadership positions, are our management positions, uh, have, do they have gender parity. You know, we can't stop as far as in the public sector if we have 33% uh, reservation or 50% reservation for women in parliaments, then we have to ensure that once women are in parliament, are, are they making key decisions, are they in key uh, are there in key positions in political parties and in governments? So we have to keep continuously keep evaluating ourselves, whether uh, whether at home or whether in or whether when we're looking at uh, other organisations and institutions. Right. Thank you very much uh, for that, Mandeep. And um, uh, I want to um, after the next speaker, I want to perhaps come um, come back to Mutsia as well to see whether he has any comments to make on that on that last question. But first of all. Saira has asked to uh, come in. Um, I think you wanted to respond to Sunita's question and point and maybe bring an example yourself of, of some good practice, Saira. So go ahead. And, and it's your first time to speak, so say hello to everybody. Hi, everybody. You've uh, seen my name on every email and message about this um, webinar. So now, now you can be assured it's not Saira's webinar. It is a Civicus webinar. <laughs> Um, now, I know that Sylvester also wanted to speak, so just to flag that, that she wanted to respond. And I just wanted to give a, an example from Turkey. There's a political party in Turkey that was started by the Kurdish movement called the People's Democratic Party, the HDP. Um, but it's a coalition party that they built, that they forged with um, feminists, with trade unionists, with leftists, with minorities. So, you know, there's Armenians and there's Alevis and there's Azidis and it's a very mixed coalition party. But they brought in the rule from the Kurdish movement that they have uh, started in, and, and some of this movement is not legal in fact, but they've brought in a gender parity rule into their political party as well where every position, every executive position, every leadership position must be co-leadership. There must be a man and a woman at, at the top of every um, committee and up to the the leadership of the party. So the leadership of the party is uh, a man and a woman. And they've also brought this down to the city level. So at the municipal level, every city government that the Heidepe Party won, uh, these are these happen to be concentrated in the southeast of the country, which is the Kurdish region of Turkey. But every city government has a co-mayorship. Uh, every head of city government. So there's a man and a woman uh, in leadership together as co-mayors. Um, and it's it's been a struggle. It's not that the women in the party say that this is an easy process. 
Um, but certainly because they've managed to make this demand, it has influenced the agenda. And they also have a veto power. So uh, the women's wing of that party is able to veto any decisions that are made by that party because uh, it's considered so critical to um, to advancement and progress that women's voices be included. So I'm, I'm always impressed by their engagement of women, by their placing of gender equality at the head of revolutionary change because it's coming out of a region where nobody expects this kind of leadership. Uh, and I think it's a brilliant example. Really fantastic. Thank you very much, Sarah. And thanks for everything you've done to make this webinar happen as well. Um, it's interesting, we're in the history of social movements, um, if you know your women's history at least, the, the times where, where women really have been at the forefront of defining and designing the, the, the social movements, even the kind of tactics of social movements from striking to boycotting were invented by, by, often by women um, at the forefront of those movements, which, whose contribution was all, all too often forgotten once those movements gained power and voice and, and of course money. Uh, we're seeing, I think, some. Uh, whether anybody on the call is following what's happening around the Black Lives Matter movement in the U.S., but that's no uh, surprise to me that that's come from not just African American feminists, but African American queer feminists who've been excluded somehow from all of the different movements, but who've sort of shone through and really been able to make a massive impact in terms of the civil rights movement in in the U.S. It's really quite quite an exciting, I think, but uh, example of that happening today. So I wanted to come to you, Mutsia, if you're still there, and see whether you had any comments you wanted to add on the on the last few questions. And then I'm going to come back to Sudarshana, and then I've got Antonella, who's still waiting to speak patiently. So in that order, Mutsia first. Um, I I think I just want to share another example of of this this concept of uh, um, leadership and. It's with regard to LGBTI advocacy in Kenya. You would think that the most accessible or easy way for people to start wrapping their heads around sexual and gender diversity is by understanding the diversity of sexual orientation. But the transgender movement in Kenya, particularly um, the organizing by transgender women, has really laid the groundwork for understanding sexual and gender diversity so, so that even today as you go across Kenya there's a greater public understanding of transgender issues and gender diversity than there is of sexual orientation and it could be because patriarchy serves for people to be more uncomfortable about sexual relations and more sympathetic about gender issues but <coughs> But it, it, it's quite commendable that the most early court cases that have been won by the LGBT movement um, around uh, registration of organizations, recognition of um, um, chosen names, have actually predated a lot of um, litigation and advocacy from um, lesbian, gay, and bisexual people. Thank you very much for that, Mutia. Thank you very much. Um, and I think we have seen some similar things also across across Europe with with uh, respect to LGBT rights and recognition. And often it's those groups which appear to be perhaps the most excluded, which which are actually at the forefront of a lot of the most radical change. Um, uh, so, Sudarshana, I wanted to give you. I think you were wanting to re respond to one of the previous questions, if I'm not mistaken. I'm going to give you the voice back. There we are. Yeah, just uh, kind of uh, to say that, uh, to say that you know, uh, a lot of my comparisons have been to the corporate sector and what we've been doing. Uh, not to say that actually the civil society sector is worse off than the corporate sector. The corporate sector is still far behind in terms of you know, uh, gender parity, in terms of leadership, and where they are. Uh, but to kind of say that some of this public scrutiny is possibly higher in the corporate sector than it has been in the civil society sector. Uh, just to make that distinction clear, uh, you know, uh, the corporate sector in many places, the, uh, the women CEOs are 
possibly at you know, 10 percent of the entire uh, number of CEOs as compared to 30 percent in the non-profit sector. So just wanted to make that distinction here. The other thing that uh, Sunita mentioned uh, about Australia, I just wanted to say that what has been really interesting about Australia has been that there has been a workplace gender equality agency which requires every single corporate or every single organization that is a non-public, non-government organization, uh, whether it's the private sector or otherwise, uh, to actually file a report, uh, file a survey, so self-assessment that they do uh, to kind of talk about gender equality uh, within their organization. And that's generating an immense amount of data, uh, which then it can be, which is made public uh, at an aggregate level to compare what's happening uh, in terms of gender equality within or the organization. If you haven't seen it, uh, uh, do go to the Workplace Gender Equality Agency and see their survey. It's quite interesting. Uh, uh, they have uh, really clear uh, data points and clear indicators uh, for doing the self-assessment. Um, that's uh, in terms of responding to Sunita. In terms of Karen, uh, responding to Karen uh, uh, looking at gender equality within uh, mainstreaming within projects, I uh, just uh, wanted to kind of uh, say what, uh, kind of agree with Mandeep in terms of the fact that you need to set clear targets uh, within your projects as well uh, to make sure that uh, gender mainstreaming happens. And you need to make sure there is budget. Often what's missing in any of these, whether these are gender equality, uh, whether it's gender equality initiatives at the organization level or gender mainstreaming is uh, in projects is that you don't, don't cost it, you don't budget for it. Uh, so some of the interesting examples that we've seen in, in terms of gender equality or just looking at equality and inclusion is looking at providing some additional facilities or uh, additional costs uh, for uh, taking these initiatives for it. For example, in India, safety is a huge concern. Uh, and some organizations, many, uh, some of these nonprofit organizations have now put in policies in place to make sure that if women stay back late, uh, they, uh, they have adequate travel and that kind of cost is budgeted for. So I'm saying whether it's a gender mainstreaming in a project or whether it's an organization, you have to have that budgeted and costed for. That's right. really, really, really agree with that. Though, giving that's part of what you said earlier about having the real leadership commitment is that there's actually proper resources to do this properly and it's not seen to be yet another bit of unpaid work that women have to do on top of their on top of their day jobs i i've, I've got one very patient um participant Antoinette. you've been trying to contribute for a while but i somehow lost you in the in the list so i'm going to unmute you now and i hope you can share a bit your question your, your experience from the us particularly around the sort of uh, race and gender diversity i think over to you Antoinette. Okay, no, we can't hear you. Okay, so I'm going to um, see if I can find the question and read it on Antoinette's behalf. Let's see if that works. Antoinette? Yes, can you hear me? I can now. Please go ahead. And okay, thank, thank you. Thank you for being patient. <laughs> Thank you, Joanna. Yes. So I am living in the United States, but like Karen, I am actually Jamaican. So I, being from the Caribbean and seeing how women, well, in Jamaica in particular, it was never an over gender inequality concern because what happens culturally is that you find like a lot of single parent households. So women are almost expected to raise their kids themselves and work and do everything without men being accountable. But at the same time, we weren't blocked from educational opportunities. But then outside of that, we were still having to be professionals, to be breadwinners, head of the family, and all of that. So I have that perspective. Now, living in the United States, and especially in a state where patriarchy is heavily perpetuated through religion, where everything is literally male streamed it's it's a very different perspective and what i find is when we have gender dis, diver, not gender discussion but diversity discussions here in my state 
it's typically centered around race relations. I find that any in gender topics or topics about gender really do not make it on the agenda. They're not really heavily discussed because there's so much focus on black and white issues that when people think about diversity, they're not really thinking about gender. So working in a policy-oriented atmosphere, and you try to put that in the forefront and try to have our concerns uh, become a focus, they're readily sidestepped because, again, they're looking at police relations, Black Lives Matter, and all of those things. Now, they're really relevant, but within those domains, you do find that women are further silenced. And as you mentioned about black feminists, black queer feminists, they're forever silenced because it really goes back to the fact that women are continuously man-interrupted. You know, you have something to say, but you cannot say it without it being um, sanctioned by a male counterpart. So that's what I'm finding right now here in America and specifically in my state that gender issues are not really discussed. They're really not thought about. They're overshadowed by whatever, whatever else is going, I'm sorry, that is going on. So I think for me, what I would, what I would love to see is a focus on that. Then with the influx of refugees that I'm getting in the state of Utah, we find that now we're talking about um, gender relation, not gender relation, gender issues, but in terms of gender-based violence, domestic violence within that specific confine. Now that is not an issue, but it's kind of concerning that the only time women get any attention or their rights are being honored or discussed is when they're a victim of something. And that is, we're not always looking to be helped or to be supported in that way, but what we want is to be less voiceless. So again, you know, I have such a bilateral perspective, being from the Caribbean and living here and trying to move to Europe. So it's like so many different perspectives I have that I find it very concerning globally that women are forever undermined in their issues. Now, there was a point that was mentioned earlier, and I think it was Mandeep or was, was talking about how the private sector, maybe it's not him, private sector is doing a better job than civil societies where gender roles and rights are concerned. And I could see that, but what I also find is everything is so political that you're not sure if they're either getting what gender rights mean, and I keep saying it on Twitter, it's not about male bashing, it's not about isolating males, we want them to be our allies, we want them to be part of the discussion, we want them to be part of the solution, right? But I find that every time we talk about that here, it's always about, okay, there goes, there goes, there goes, goes those feminists, you know, they want to bash males, they want to get males out of the society, they want to take over. And I think, again, coming from all these perspectives, having lived in these different places, you find that it is so misconstrued and is so sidestepped that I don't know at what point we can have gender discussion, apart from the you know, General Assembly that occurred last week, in an open, fair, and healthy way. It's very extreme, where it's either male bashing or their victims. And all right. you're saying Thank is, you. yeah. So. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think that happens so often. I hear stories um, of people really becoming becoming feminists or really realizing the extent of uh, gender inequality when they move from one culture or one place to another, um, often from one country to another, but it might also be from one organization to another, where they see the different uh, difference in treatment. And I think you really raised an important uh, issue there, which is about uh, diversity. Sure, it's about gender, but it's also about race. It's also about inclusion of people with disabilities. And those intersections of, of, of different marginalizations and exclusions can be particularly um, hard to overcome. So what we see in Europe is there's a lot more emphasis on gender diversity, and often the issues of race are, are, um, are silenced or disappeared. And so for us as a, as a feminist organization here in Europe, we really seek to improve our inclusion of issues around race 
um, for, uh, and exclusion of women of color, for example, or migrant or migrant women. So I think um, it was really important that you raised that. And I, I suppose when you come to Europe, uh, you will see and learn more things, Antoinette. So thanks for that. So I want to draw things to a close now. Um, I wondered whether if any of our um, panelists still had another final word that they wanted to share. Um, if so, I'm going to give you each like 30 seconds to pick up on any point that particularly uh, resonated or you feel uh, you want to stress. Then I'm going to go to, to Syra, who's going to wrap, tell us a bit more about the feedback and the follow-up of this webinar as well. Um, so let's perhaps start with Mandeep. Mandeep, I've given you the voice. Thanks, Thank you. This has been a really interesting uh, discussion. I think one of the big challenges to gender justice and which presents a great impediment for us in civil society is when the recourse is taken by those who, do, who resist change to religious and cultural values, which are oftentimes steeped in ideologies and you know philosophies that are sometimes centuries old. And, 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 and as we know, gender justice has been an evolving concept and you know, the, as, as we keep making progress on uh, greater equality uh, as far as on, on gender, it, it evolves and it changes. And I think for us to be able to do that, we really need to work a lot with, uh, to be able to achieve gender parity and gender, gender justice. We really need to start looking at influencing religious and cultural leaders who oftentimes are the uh, are also sometimes the, the uh, you know the ones who are opposed to to gender justice concepts but that's i want to leave us all with that with that thought and uh, of of the need to you know to get more um, uh, to get more progressive interpretations of uh, texts and values and so on Excellent. Thank you so much, Mandy, and thanks for all your um, brilliant participation in this and for really encouraging this uh, topic to have more air in the State of Civil Society report. So, um, Mujti, are you still with us? Would you like to make a final short comment? Yeah, I'm, I'm still here and I, I just want to appreciate this call. Uh, despite the techno technological challenges at the beginning, we all were able to make the call. So thank you for putting this together and allowing us to have this conversation. Oh, thank you very much. And I'm going to come now to Sudarshana. Any final comments from you? Hi. Yeah, just wanted to thank uh, everybody. Uh, Joanna, thanks for moderating this panel. Uh, thanks, Sivikas, for organizing, and Saira for following up, uh, following up with us patiently and organizing uh, this panel as well. Just wanted to kind of say that you know it's so important uh, uh, what Mandeep said about gender justice. Uh, let's kind of talk about equality and inclusion uh, and the intersectionality. Uh, around it. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, let's actually kind of uh, bring leaders of civil society organizations together uh, to kind of think about what we can do around gender equality uh, within these organizations. Thank yeah, you. That, and that sounds like a great idea, a great proposal to bring to Civicus really, in terms of something they, they could do to create space uh, within the leadership to recognize and air the, the, the extent of the challenge and issue within civil society. You talked a lot about the data, uh, but then also to share some strategies, what's working and what's, what's not working. And I think we had to hear, heard some really great ideas of, of different strategies that can be used, um, creating space. I'm a big believer in, in, in spaces for different groups to come together and really air their, their concerns. Here in Brussels, this might be inspire some action for some of the rest of you. We have um, a network of women feminist leaders in civil society, and we meet three or four times a year. It's not a huge amount of, um, of time, but it's an amazing um, spirit of sharing and learning that we, we bring really around these issues of challenging sexism, challenging sexual harassment, challenging um, the organizations which are sadly and disappointingly still um, excluding, excluding women really from positions of authority or interrupting them, the classic stuff that you expect in, in uh, non, not civil society organizations. So that's also, I think, a really practical way, creating women-only spaces um, and feminist spaces. And I use the word women in a broader sense of self-defined women. You could also organize spaces for people of color or people with disabilities that they can, they can really build a kind of um, 
uh, a caucus that can bring their concerns and raise them up and that needs leadership support as well and resources um, I heard also. So um, I wanted to thank all of our amazing participants and for Civicus for giving space to this really this issue which is really close to my heart and I think we as civil society can't be the organizations and, and bring the change and the radical change which is needed in the world right now unless we look at ourselves radically and think very differently about the kind of voice and leadership we want to bring uh, to our own organizations. Um, and with that, I wanted to give the floor to Syra, who's tirelessly worked to organize this and perhaps to say a few words about the follow-up and evaluation, Syra. So uh, you're, you're going to get the last word. Hi, everybody. So um, to give a little bit of, of background, part of the reason for this call uh, and for, for my shaping it in such a way that we would have a good amount of time for participant discussion uh, was that this is feeding into a, a new community of practice that Civicus is starting. Um, Civicus is developing a gender working group, so a community of practice that will focus on um, you know, organizations and, and activists and, and members of Civicus who are interested in driving the uh, agenda of gender equality forward. And, and we're looking at that as, as Joanna had mentioned and, and as you can see from the agenda of this call and what guest essays were selected, we're taking a broad view of gender. So not simply binary and it has to be uh, women, uh, cis women, anything like this, no, um, not at all. So the purpose of this discussion was partly really to get uh, ideas about what are useful activities for Civicus's gender working group to take up? Um, so, you know, you're feeding into this discussion for a purpose, and we're going to take this information back to the gender working group as we develop uh, uh, future plans for that network, that community of practice. And there's an evaluation form that the link has been shared in the chat by Joanna, and uh, I'll email it out to all of the, the people who registered previously. Unfortunately, I can't see who's online specifically, but all the registrants will get it. Now, that form is about a strategic planning consultation process that Civicus is involved in, because there's a new strategic plan beginning uh, next year. So it's a general form, uh, as you'll see and only has a few brief questions, but there's a comment box at the end. So I'm going to ask you to please take a few minutes, fill in the form, it's a very brief form, but in the comment box you can add any other thoughts about what you think that uh, a civil society network like Civicus with its gender working group can be doing to promote greater inclusion and gender equality. Uh, and we are really, really keen to hear your comments. You, you've had a lot of interesting things to say. Uh, I wish the technology was more conducive and we could have had a bit more interaction, but we did really well um, with you know these last minute changes. So I also want to thank everybody for uh, all your efforts. So I think we're gonna bring it to a close now. So thanks to everybody. I hope you'll take a moment to give feedback to Civicus and I think also to encourage uh, perhaps other people you know who couldn't be on the call to think about what, what do you think Civicus needs to include in its strategic plan taking this stuff forward. And also really urge you to read the essays because they're absolutely fantastic. And now in preparing for this um, call, I was kind of forced to go back and, and read them in more detail. And I was just really impressed with the quality and, and content. And it just shows you never stop learning um, new things and new ways of doing things. So thanks to everybody. Thanks to Civicus. Thanks to Syrah. And... Goodbye, I'm going to bring this to a close.